In a way, the phenomena of the IDW intellectual diet web has kind of flagged this up, that there seems to be a quality of conversation that's had where we're genuinely going in without knowing the answer. This is the meta conversation. It's like, th there's one thing to come up with the right answers, but even more important is, how do we have the kind of conversations that will allow us to find these right answers? Well, it seems to me that the beginning is to name it, thusly. Right, which is to say, when I, when I watch, and most specifically when I watch, watch Ed, like when, the, when these individuals were just beginning to enter into conversation with each other, um, well, some of the ideas that they were talking about were insightful and interesting. I found that what was by far much more interesting is what you're talking about, which was noticing that there was something different about what happened when somebody was, well, thinking, right? and endeavoring to listen to what the other person was saying, and in not just responding with their prefab response that they had already written down on a piece of paper or had learned from somebody else, but actually really contemplating it deeply and endeavoring to express something that potentially created something new, or at least helpful. Um, and when I noticed that, I noticed two different things. One was that that was vastly more interesting. And the other one is that it felt like goodness. It felt like something that was needing, that was, that was needful. Like, uh, you know, eating when you're hungry. Or more specifically, actually, more of a feeling of safety. Which I imagine is actually the feeling of hero. Right? It's the feeling of when people are doing something that is necessary in a time when it is necessary. And in particular, when it is not common. Like I imagine it's maybe the feeling that somebody has when they see the fireman coming, when a fire is raging. Right? Courage is a, is a part of that sensation. Um, and it is certainly the case that in this, in this moment, in order to speak honestly, requires courage. Um, and I was going to say, in particular, when what you have to say is not that which is in alignment with good opinion. But oddly enough, I think it's even when it is in alignment with good opinion. Because I think there's something in the ambient environment that, that feels honesty as a, as a bad thing in and of itself. Like almost a a, a complicity to always be ever so slightly ironic uh, and never be fully connected to trying to speak honestly. But at the same time, human beings have evolved. In fact, we won't even say it's the essence of what we are that differentiates us from our primate ancestors to be very, very attracted to honest, insightful expression. So I think both are happening simultaneously. I was reminded when you, were, um, when you said that it felt like something good, a quote that the guy who put together the intellectual dark website used at the top of one of his pages was, when two or three gather in my name, I am there with them. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a biblical quote. Yeah. And I was very struck by that. It, it really fits with what you were saying about there, there's a sense of something good happening when when these people get together and talk in this way. Yes, I think this is right. And I think it's deep, which is to say that, well, I'll, let me use maybe Peterson's framework just to make it well, self-reflective. Self um, it seems to me that there is something that happens when two or more gather together in my name. And Oftentimes in history, we've needed that something to make it. Right? The situation was not easy. The situation was complex, challenging. And so it required that something, that whatever it is that happens when we are gathered together in a space of, well, collaboration. Let's just make it again very simple. Um, a space of peace space of mutual understanding, not for the purpose of delivering on 
the same opinion, but really for going deep and trying to find something which is trying to frankly express itself, like to listen. And so, if that story, the story that I just told is true, then it would be in our bones. You know, it would be in our deepest mythology, in our deepest traditions, our deepest religion, that this is the place to go. That when trouble is brewing, gather together, enter into this space. This is where we do these sorts of things. This is how we solve these kinds of problems. And you've spoken before that that can almost only happen in, in direct interpersonal dialogue. It's very difficult for it to happen in any other, any other means. Well, I have noticed being able to get there in virtual environments. Not very often or very common in just text, like Facebook posts. It seems like there is a relationship between the, the richness of the possibility of interaction and both the possibility and the quality of the relationship. So it's a lot better and stronger, richer and easier uh, interpersonally. Um, but I don't think it's impossible. In fact, I know it's not impossible. I definitely have felt entering into this kind of relationship in, say, podcasts. I imagine that in some, well, among some certain kinds of people, or maybe at some future date with this becoming a practice that many people go through, that it may actually be effortless and that people are able to enter into this often. There's a whole different story that maybe we'll get into another time as to why that isn't how we always are. If we are, if we are in the matrix as a, an analogy, a metaphor, what is the matrix? Okay, so to be meta, just to be aware, the first thing that I want to notice is that for us to do this right, we need to be in a space of collaboration. So the invitation is to have this not be question and answer, i.e. I am not the authority and you are not the listener, but rather we are collaborating on this question. So let's put the question in the middle. We are exploring the question of what is the matrix? So one of the things that really popped into my head very cleanly was this notion of, that we've been using just in this dialogue, of simulated thinking as being very much like a computer. It seems like there's something about the way that the human mind can be made unable to relate to the world and instead run a program run an ideology where it constantly reframes its perceptions in accordance with the ideology as opposed to honestly and in humility relating to reality that makes it exquisitely vulnerable to control. I would maybe bring in Wittgenstein's idea of the bewitchment of language. Okay. That, that the idea, I think he said philosophy is about, um, I'd love to know the exact quote, but it is effectively un undoing the process of the bewitchment of language. That there's something in the nature of language, the nature of being able to think in concepts, that somehow flips into making us a prisoner of those concepts. Well, interestingly enough, oh, very cool. So as you were speaking, you actually said, I wish I had the quote. Mm. And that's the bewitchment of language which is to think that the exact specification of the actual sounds is the thing, mm. but it's not. It's the essence of what he was trying to say. And so mm. to convey the essence is the thing that we actually want. Did I get that? Yes, you did, <laughs> which is why it was so interesting. Like it popped in, I actually initially was struggling with the actual words, and then I realized that what I really just needed to do is to listen. Mm. It was trying to express itself through the words. Um, I think this is very... I think that's like the, a big idea that's not, like imagine, imagine that, that I'm not very good at expressing myself. And also imagine that I'm trying to express something which is both deep and important. Well, either you're going to you're just going to have to ignore me, right, and just move on because I'm not going to be able to give it to you whole cloth and sort of perfectly wrapped magical material, or we're going to have to fucking work together. We're going to have to both identify and recognize there's something here 
mm. that maybe I have some piece of, and if you can sense it at all, that means you have a piece of it too. Mm. So now we're endeavoring collectively to kind of get a size of this thing. You know, it's the, uh, you know, those blind, the blind men and the elephant, mm. except in this case, maybe you're seeing it and I'm hearing it. Mm. And I can kind of describe it as a sound and it's, I don't really know what it is. You're like, yeah, it's weird. It's, maybe it's coming from this kind of large lumpy object. Like, hmm, mm. that's neat. Well, everything interesting is going to be of that sort. Right? It's never been said before. Then it's very unlikely that I have a very clean way of expressing it. Mm. And if it's interesting, it's likely it's going to be hard to express. And so we enter into that. Right? We enter into a place where if you see, if you perceive the words that I'm using as being more of a map, more of a hint, mm. more of a a way to try to sort of begin the process of orientation around something which is itself transcendent. Mm -hmm. And we're endeavoring to actually find a way to tune into the transcendent using the words literally just as a way to make it more real, mm -hmm. more shareable, more clear. And in terms of the, what this looks like, what this kind of dialogue looks like, there's a, there's a form of, it's almost like a, a meditation, a speaking meditation that w I was taught um, by Raffia, who is the, the, the guy who is kind of leading, helping us lead some of the men's work we're doing. And it's called inquiry. And it's a form that, that came from the, the essence work that Almas put together. Um, and the, the, the idea of inquiry is that you acknowledge you don't know the answer. So you try and enter a space where you're listening to yourself as you're speaking, mm -hmm. as much as you're listening to the other person. And you are able to be surprised by what might come, might come out. And it's a, very, it's a practice of learning to, to feel into what wants to emerge. So it's a, kind of, it's, a, it's a form of meditation in that you have to learn that kind of nuance and learn that sensitivity to yourself and what wants to emerge, which maybe fits with Jordan Peterson's observation that pay attention to how your words make you feel. Is this something that makes you stronger or is it something that makes you weaker? Mm. There's some kind of, I don't know, almost like really deep listening to ourselves that we need to do to be able to get into this space. Well, I can tell you that as you were saying that, I was feeling very, um, felt good. And this is because I did not know the name that you described or the individual whose name you gave. Um, and yet this sounds very much like what I've been trying to do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not, I don't recall that this has always been the way that I've endeavored to listen and to speak. And it's not always, but it is always the best. Um, and that I've also noticed that it becomes easier. That it is possible to actually have this place where you are somehow outside of yourself, you're fully in yourself and you're expressing simultaneously. And that from that place is where you know, something really interesting begins to be possible. It's kind of aligning ourselves with the creative principle, as again, Peterson talks about, the logos. Mm. Yeah, that sounds really nice. Yeah, it's interesting. So as I'm being very, 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 like noticing very closely, um, it's initially very raw. Like I said, literally just a pleasure. Hmm, yes, that feels good. Okay, what was that? Ah, that feels like what happens when something in me senses that what just was expressed. Yes, I can say yes to that. And then after I say yes to it, I can try to put more into it. What about it was the thing that was yes? Um, I've actually been very interested in this notion of the Logos for a long time. I studied ancient Greek. I um, They've contemplated it, and this, the way that you just described it was very nice. That, that the alignment with the creative principle. Mm -hmm. And that feels very clean. Mm. It feels like it's a, well, true. In a, a very specific Petersonian sense. Mm. I wish we could find a way to make that simple. That little disagreement, it bothers me. Mm. Which disagreement? Uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson and the nature of truth. Mm. Do you have a sense on what it might be? I know what it is, I just can't make it simple. I can't even say it clearly. I'll, I can try to say it not clearly, but that's always you know, <laughs> frustrating. Um, 
It just comes down to the fact that there are multiple different kinds of epistemology. That the word true doesn't mean the same thing in every context. Like for example, I can, I can true an instrument. I can also, my aim can be true. Um, and then of course a statement can be true. And these are related to each other, but they also cover a different distance. The way I would say it is, the, is that distinction that I used earlier between something which is thought or a model and something which is lived. So that a, a model is true to the degree to which it corresponds with reality. Call that Harris truth. But a practice is true to the degree to which it generates thriving. Petersonian truth. It's just literally just two different kinds of truth in different domains. And so getting confused about them is just getting confused about the fact that you're actually talking about two different kinds of domains that respond to two different kinds of truth that are associated with two different aspects of reality. And they don't cross over. There's no point in comparing them. Uh, they can be in relationship, as we've discussed. You know, Harrison, Harris, Sam Harris truth, scientific truth, um, is able to make it possible for us to be able to be more religious, in the sense that we can make better choices if we know what is true. At the same time, Petersonian truth, lived truth, is about us actually making actually better choices in our actual lives, um, which is just a different thing. So maybe that was simple. Uh, Peterson talks about scientific truth being nested within his concept of the truth, that scientific truth is a subset of truth, whereas the wider truth includes, yeah, thriving, it's pragmatic, it's it's about what, what pushes us forward as Darwinian beings. The, the, the only definition of truth we can have is a definition of what gets us. It has to be practical. What I would say, and this is just the way that I perceive it, is that these kinds of truth are distinct, but they are also inseparable. And that lived truth is more basic or more fundamental than scientific truth. But they are distinct. So it's not really a relationship of containment. Um, it's more of a relationship of, well, it's a very complicated relationship. It's not, it, that is very not simple. What does it look like, do you think, the, what we need to do to come together or to to, to be able to form the collective intelligence that's going to get us through the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, I actually think it's mm, relatively easily said. Not so easily done. It seems like there's two basic moves. The first move, well, we've used the phrase exit or escape the matrix. So it's something along the lines of free your mind and your body from this legacy environment, this legacy civilization, the blue church, and all the other accoutrements of that environment. Most notably, your mind. The second move is, well, make it more of a complex of moves. Become sovereign. Find the others, enter into a, you know, two or more among us in my name, with them, enter into collaboration with them, become sovereign as a group, in some sense that's it. Because that thing, that gathering of sovereigns who are entering into a relationship of higher level sovereignty, has a level of consciousness, and a level of intelligence, and a level of wisdom that is, well, certainly much more than any of us as individuals or any existing institution has now. The only real novelty, right, the only thing that, that we don't actually know how to do at all, is how to do that with more than an old-fashioned tribe of people. 
so we can build the skill. It's ambient. It's part of our basic toolkit of being people. If we can, we can unlearn a lot of the adaptive techniques and strategies and habits and biases of civilization one, of what I call game A, the blue church and all of its past versions. We've done learn that, a lot of it. We have to relearn a lot of these basic things, but the basic things are still basic. So we can relearn that. We can instantiate the basic human toolkit of how to be people with each other. And in that environment, we have what it takes to be able to enter into this relationship of coherence. But evolution only got us up to about 150 people. It's called the Dunbar limit if we want to be intellectuals. It's sort of the, the maximum size of a fully coherent tribe. And we should be mindful of the fact that, that, makes, that that's actually truly coherent only in the context where we're all related. We're really a tribe. Like every single person in that tribe was born in that tribe and raised in that tribe. Then you have a coherent group of 150. These days with practice, maybe you can get it up to 30 or 50. I'm sure that some communities can get a little bit higher, but not a lot. But our challenge is actually harder. Just doing that, as great as that would be, um, doesn't actually solve the problem. We actually have to figure out how to do it with everybody. We have to find a way to scale coherence well beyond 150. Um, maybe even all the way to everybody. Certainly into the small digit thousands, 15, 150,000. That's new, right? But the way we're going to get there is by this first step. You know, so individuals becoming sovereign, recovering that which is theirs in the first place, and then entering into this relationship of coherence with other individuals and becoming skillful at that, becoming masterful at that, and then using that from that place, then doing the next work. That's the place to do the next work. Um, what I find most problematic, painful, and distressing is when people try to do it from the old place. It won't work. It can't work. That style of thinking and that style of coordination, of working together, um, it's just the wrong tool for the job. There's sort of a, what's coming through for me is a sort of sense of trusting the field. Mm. And it's very difficult to sort of express this in a way that doesn't feel um, sort of not crunchy enough for um, kind of game A type people. Mm -hmm. But the sense is if we are able to come together in, in that space, then the right answers by definition will come up because that's the nature of creativity, that's the nature of consciousness, that's the nature of getting out of our own way enough for the right things to arise. Well, I, I don't feel that I have to go... That sounded to me like it, it was uh, teleological. And it may be. I think the point here is that I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Um, I think it's not the kind of thing that you can know. But I don't feel like I need to. Because the only thing that you can really endeavor to do is the best that you can do. It may be that it's not enough. It may be that we do not have it in us to make it through this. But this is the way that we can do the best that we can do. And so if it is there, if the answer is to be found, this is the way to find it. Um, and to feel that it is a, uh, a meaningful endeavor to do so. So that even if the answer isn't there, our effort was meaningful. How does this link to sovereignty? So we're dealing with a word, a sound, and I want to actually put that in your mind first. We're dealing with a sound, sovereignty, which by the way, if your mind is the kind of mind that knows how to speak language, is going to interpret that as a word. And then, if it uses words and associates them with, that, with meaning, it's going to download a whole scheme of meaning. Notice that it doesn't have to. You could just choose to listen to it as a sound. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is that it's very important in the context of sovereignty to be able to actually take responsibility for all of these steps. Because in a conversation with somebody, they may utter a sound that you goddamn think means something specific, and they may mean something completely different. And if you can't actually be able to slow down and say, hold on, wait a minute, I thought you said this, as opposed to getting into an argument about what you for sure know they said, be able to actually slow down and say, hey, wait, there's something, something's off. I'm not quite sure where it is. Let's back up a bit. Oh, when you use the word, the sound, you uttered the sound sovereignty, it seems like you may have meant something different than what John Locke was writing about, or what the the folks in Montana keep carrying on about. Well, what do you mean by that? So let me describe what I mean by it. Um, 
And the reason why I'm doing this is because I think, A, what I'm describing is a more powerful version of the essence of what that term has long intended to mean. I'm kind of recovering it from the legacy of feudalism, wrenching it finally from the, from the grips of long dead kings and finally putting it back in the place where it belongs, which is in, in fact sovereign individuals. But then in order to do that, I have to actually give it the meaning. Right? You aren't born sovereign. That's reapplying the feudalist model, right? You're born the king to this new thing. What does it mean to be sovereign? Well, what it means to be sovereign is, well, first of all, it's contextual. It, it, it describes the degree to which you have the capacity, you have the ability to respond to the circumstances that you find yourself in, in such a way as to maintain or increase your ability to respond to the circumstances in which you find yourself in. It's very simple, it's a loop, right? So let's say, for example, I am sober and I am standing. And I am sovereign in the context of standing, meaning that I can keep standing. The likelihood that I will spontaneously fall down is relatively low. Keep drinking. At a certain point, I actually lose my sovereignty. I will spontaneously transform from a state of standing to a state of no longer standing. I have destroyed my sovereignty in the domain of standing. We can do this all over the place. Um, oftentimes, say, fighting or martial arts is a good one. So every martial artist, including boxing and fencing and things like that, is aware of the fact that there's a relationship between your balance, your center, where you are in terms of poised in, in, in ability to act. And then what happens when you extend yourself? Right? So in a, an optimal space, I'm in a place where I can, I can respond to anything you do as swiftly as I can with maximum impact and with a maximum ability to be able to respond in the next moment. Right? So I don't want to get into a place where I'm suddenly on my heels, where my balance is off. Or I don't want to swing so hard that if I miss, I'm now completely vulnerable and I can't do anything. And if I do swing very hard, I've made that calculated choice, the next thing I have to do is I have to get back into, into balance. I have to get right into the stance. So it's like a physical example. Dancers have the same sensibility, right? So it's a sense of being able to be centered and poised. But it's always in relationship to a context. Uh, and it's always very complex. Um, you know, let's say, do you ever watch the, the French soccer player Zinedine Zidane? Uh, we might say that he was very sovereign in the domain of soccer but not particularly sovereign in the domain of having his sister critiqued by an Italian soccer player, if you recall. Right? He went from being a masterful champion of soccer to somebody who was headbutting somebody in the field and getting his ass kicked off the field. Right? So his sovereignty was masterful in one domain, but had a sort of fractal or a, a very specific vulnerability that got popped and caused the whole, and caused the whole thing to pop. Right? He literally got removed from the field. He's no longer even a soccer player. So this is the idea. Now what we can do is we can generalize that. So I can, I can speak about your sovereignty in a given domain, and then I can sort of think about your general sovereignty, which is your sovereignty in an arbitrarily large number of domains. And of course that, that involves more general capacities. So, and that's, that's like the give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man a fish, he eats forever. You, know, you can become sovereign in some domain, but you can also build a higher order capacity, which gives you a generalized capacity for sovereignty in all domains. So for example, the capacity of discernment, or the capacity of just self-awareness. Let's just do a simple one. Knowing what your emotional state is, being able to be conscious of your emotional state, is a general purpose, always useful ingredient of any form of sovereignty. And if you know that your opponent is goading you and it's making you angry, and that's taking you out of your game, well, that at least gives you the ability to maybe choose not to be so angry and not be out of your game. If you know that you're getting anxious and fearful while you're trying to walk across the tightrope and that's gonna cause you to fall, then okay, maybe you can. So that, that's a more fundamental capacity that's associated with general purpose sovereignty. There's a whole list of these kinds of capacities. So let me hold that for a second and come back. So now we have a basic idea of what sovereignty means in this context, the way that I'm trying to use it. Now what I wanna say is that the reason why that concept is so powerful and important is that sovereignty is what is necessary to be able to play a role in this new emergent sense-making fabric. Right? Remember in the broadcast model, you had to be sort of a very high quality computer. In this new model, you have to be sovereign. And the more sovereign you are, the more effectively you can actually play a role in this thing. Because the more capacity you have to receive from the world, to process it in a way that is responsible, that you can actually respond to it with the fullest aspect of what it is you have to bear to it. You're not merely, uh, well, it's not rocking you out of balance. Um, and you have the ability to choose the best choice that you can make. 
whatever it happens to be. It may be that you're not very, you haven't got many choices, but you can let's choose the best choice. And then you can send that best choice out with the highest degree of, of skillfulness that you can bring out. So now you've got a, uh, an ability to listen, an ability to discern and sense, and then your ability to express. Right? And if you have these three aspects in high, in, in a symmetric relationship, and in a sovereign container so that they're able to be integrous against various forms of challenge, which can be all kinds of things. Like one, one thing that might overwhelm your sovereignty is just the velocity of input. If you hook yourself up to social media and just like scroll through Facebook for 10 hours, you're probably overwhelming your sovereignty. Most people's brains can't handle that much dopamine and, and uh, serotonin and you know, nonsense. Um, other words are actually even more simple. If you haven't been eating at all for the past 10 hours, you're likely breaking your sovereignty. Right? Your body needs fuel to operate, to be able to operate effectively. So religion, and to some extent also spirituality, building practices that are able to support an increase in individual sovereignty, so as to be able to enter into relationships with others, so as to increase your collaborative sovereignty. These are properly spiritual and religious domains. So now we're actually reinvigorating the whole notion of religion. We're using a more fundamental definition. I guess this is the big paradox for me about meaningful collaboration can only happen from a point of deep individual sovereignty. To really connect and really connect with someone else can only come from a place of being fully resourced in myself. Well, you were, use the word deep. So if, if, as long as you use the word deep, I completely agree. Um, you know, we, can have, we can have meaningful collaboration even when we're both in reasonably poor sovereignty. It's just we just got lucky. Or it hit us in a place that was most needful. Right? It may be that the thing that our collaboration did is gave rise to how to increase our sovereignty. But for sure, if we want to use collaboration reliably, and if we want to go really deep, this is now conditioned on a depth of sovereignty and a depth of skillfulness in listening, having discernment, and then expressing clearly. Right? So um, the capacity to be present to what's happening without allowing yourself to be moved out of your skillfulness, and then the actual skillfulness to be able to deal with that situation well are what, is, what needs to happen. And again, we can talk about this in particular domains, like maybe in, say, computer science as a programmer. But there's, in this new world, things aren't simple. You aren't a computer programmer. You may be playing the role of computer programmer for 15 minutes, but then you're also doing all kinds of things. Uh, constantly. It's constantly flowing and rejiggering and maybe actually I had a very interesting person uh, write me a message yesterday about decentralized autonomous organizations. Noticing that enable, to be able to deal with these things and design them, you had to sort of somehow be a sociologist, an anthropologist, an economist, and a computer scientist simultaneously. It's like, yeah, that's a really good example. And by the way, that'll be a spontaneous emergence of a particular cluster of capacities that might be the thing that you're doing for the next three or four hours, and then you're going to shift and now you're going to be a relation, in a relationship with another person and or making food, right? And of course, we know that we do that now, but we do that now in these weird kind of like disciplinary blocks. In the future, these things, and not even in the future, in the present, these things are flowing and they're mutating very, very rapidly. We're just in a world of faster change and more fluidity. So in this world of faster change and more fluidity, your sovereignty and your skillfulness need to be based on the most invariant things. So you can't just have, say, skillfulness in computer programming which is like, give a man a fish. You need to have skillfulness in learning or even having skillfulness on the basis of how one becomes having a high capacity of being able to learn. Right, so it's the deep basis. If you build a, uh, a deep basis of sovereignty and a deep basis of mastery, then you're fully prepared to participate in any form of collaboration in any context. And now things get very powerful because let's say you find yourself with a group of 10 people you've never met before in a space that you don't understand. Seems odd now, but in the future, we're gonna see that a lot. Um, well, what do you do? Well, all you do is you each as an individual figure out how to get fully clear on your own sovereignty and whatever things you do to be able to really, okay, calling this up. I need to be fully sovereign. Like, if, you know, martial arts, you get in, in a fighting stance. And then you start from nothing with each other. You know for sure that you don't yet know anything. So you begin to play experimentally. You try different things. And if you're all skillful, if you all are aware of how this works and you're all sovereign. So I say something to you that to a blue church snowflake would trigger them out of their mind, but you're sovereign. So you're aware of the fact that we're right now in a space of experimentation and playfulness. 
which doesn't mean necessarily that you're allowing me to abuse you. What it means is that you're listening and you're able to discern and you're able to be aware, wait a minute, he's actually abusing me. Clearly, you actually are able to have perception on that and you can maybe respond to that. Say, hey, wait a minute, I think we just moved into a weird space. What's going on here? And you can actually address it effectively, clearly, call it out in a way that allows me to realize, whoa, you're right, I was actually out of my sovereignty there and bring it back in. And that of course is crucial. I'm gonna call this coherence. So coherence is when people are able to enter into a relationship where they basically begin to form an emergent whole, has, has emergent properties that is greater than the individuals involved, greater than the sum of the parts. And to achieve coherence, first and foremost, requires both sovereignty and awareness of sovereignty. I mean, you, you have it and you're aware of where you are, and a continual consciousness of recognizing that you have to maintain a certain level of sovereignty to be able to enter into coherence at all. And that being in coherence has the highest intelligence, has the highest capacity to perceive and respond to the, whatever's going on. So you prioritize that. So first, am I in sovereignty? Yes. Okay, cool. Now are we in coherence? Yes. Okay, cool. Now let's start trying to do something. If not, if something's out of coherence, okay, how do we get back in coherence? Oh, is it because I'm out of sovereignty? Okay, let me get back into sovereignty and kind of building back up. What are the practices or techniques to build sovereignty? The, let, me, let me do it in terms of sort of dimensions, because we can simplify a bunch of pieces. Um, there's the body, and the body is the basis of sovereignty. So, and it's kind of simple. Like imagine a two-year-old who is cranky is not sovereign. You can actually think of your body as, as your little two-year-old. So you have to learn how to take care of yourself, how to parent yourself um, at the level of the body. So learn how to make good food choices. Learn when you're dehydrated. I mean, it's, it's amazing how often people are dehydrated and how confused they are by the fact that they are, in fact, unable to think clearly and have clean emotions when they're dehydrated. It's not confusing. Your body, it's a core metabolic necessity. Um, tired. Are you tired? Right? I mean, all, all these very basic things. Like it's, it's silly, but almost everybody gets it wrong almost all the time. So learn how to parent yourself at the level of the body. For most people alive today, the next one's going to be, be aware of your trauma. And the reality is, is that we're all effectively enormous walking bags of crazy trauma. Um, and all the various defense mechanisms that are built up around those traumas. And every experience we have is filtered through that. Well, unfortunately, that's just the case. Hopefully, in a future civilization, we're able to create human beings who don't have that. In which case, that won't be a major issue. But here it is. So, to the degree to which you can, just work through that trauma. It generally sucks, it's very painful and scary, um, and can lead to having to actually make changes in your life, which are themselves painful and scary. But nonetheless, uh, the more you can work through that, the better. Um, I mean, if you, if you find that you're going to be engaging in a race, it's probably useful to have learned how to walk first. Same thing here. Right? If you're going to be interacting with other people, the more you can have done the work beforehand that has either eliminated or addressed the trauma and the defense mechanisms, or at least has made them conscious, the better. Um, and then of course, also build practices and techniques on how to respond and bring yourself back into sovereignty when you find that these various defense mechanisms and traumas are hijacking you. There's a good concept called amygdala hijack. Like, this is actually a lot of like, very straightforward neurology. Uh, but if you feel like you're under threat, let's say for example, somebody shows up who happens to evoke the feeling of a bully who used to beat you up and you don't even, you're not even conscious of that, but suddenly your body is under threat, you may actually literally experience amygdala hijack, meaning that the blood is being pulled from your prefrontal cortex and being put into your limbic system for fight or flight responses. Well, in that case, you're not sovereign. Um, but one of the things you can do, and now in this case, two things, one is you may have some habits that you've worked on, practices, that you've trained yourself to do when you're out of sovereignty. Right? This is like a martial artist who's trained how to get back up when they've been knocked down. Like you've worked that over and over again until it's just unconscious. So you, you work that over and over again. And the second, of course, is then also always flag. Yay, I just got knocked out of sovereignty. Awesome, I've just been able to identify a blind spot that I wasn't aware of before. Learn how to be attracted to that rather than avoid it. Actually see how well you can train yourself to be attracted to experiences that traumatize you. Not to get into trauma, not to be traumatized, but to get into experiences that are triggering because of past trauma 
so that you can become conscious of it, so that you can see it and learn what the shape of it is. And then you can, of course, go in and address it and, and then ameliorate it so you can come back in. Uh, the next level is psychological and cognitive. So at the psychological level, um, if you are still running, if you're still a computer, right, if you're still running the simulator of thinking rather than thinking itself, one, be aware of that. Notice the difference between them and begin the process of trying to figure out how to rebuild for yourself your capacity to think. Now the good news is, is that's ambient, right? That's how we're born. Fortunately, human beings are broadly speaking born with a natural seeking and exploring creative thinking capacity. It is beaten out of us. It is not natural. And so to the degree to which you begin relearning that, and we can double click on that if you'd like, um, then you're moving into a space of being able to think. And this includes things like not thinking you know the answer, not thinking you understand somebody, not using the process of inter of communication to achieve power or dominance over someone else. <clears throat> This also oftentimes will show up as, for example, willful misinterpretation or self-righteousness. And these are all sort of characteristics of what not thinking looks and feels like. Thinking looks and feels like uh, curiosity. It feels like, well, humility. It feels like slowing down. It feels like having a habit of responding to confusion by slowing down and being more careful, as opposed to speeding up and skipping over it. At the cognitive level, now we've got this notion of trans-paradigmatic mind. There's a really neat concept called mapping. Uh, mapping has to do with the fact that everybody learned everything by virtue of actually experiencing things and then connecting some portion of that experience with some notion, like dog. Dog is a mapping. You have an experiential manifold of all the various dogs you've experienced, particularly the ones when you first experienced dogs, and the notion that the word dog kept being associated with something in that experiential manifold. At first, who knows, you may have cut out some big chunk of experience and associated with dog with like furry, fuzzy thing that's drooling on me and also the couch. Because you're a baby, you have no fucking idea. But over time, it's sort of the differentials sorted out. You've got a fuzzy thing, which is dog. Well, the point here is that your mapping is going to be mapping to some stuff that actually isn't part of that, just for you, much less for other people. Right? So I say sovereignty, you've got a mapping. Well, we've just gone through the process of it's at a cognitive level, we can recognize that mapping errors are just mapping errors. So flag, got a mapping error. It, what you just said doesn't make sense to me. Is this because I'm mapping it wrong or is it because I'm not understanding what you just said? Okay, cool. By the way, it's also a practice, um, but the concept is useful. Yeah, well, I mean, there's lots more, but these are examples. I wondered uh, whether you're going to touch on like meditation or any of those practices. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Um, I even talked about that in terms of the context of mysticism. So let's go into the notion of self-integration. This is a key one. This is actually the combination. So I did body and I did psychology, but I didn't do the two. So let's bring the two together. Meditation is the the becoming exquisitely aware of awareness, right, of how it is that you show up as self, absent all other things, and in its relationship with mind. Right? So one of the aspects of, of meditation is learning how to separate mind from self, learning how to separate thinking, or really it's actually the co computer mind, the programmatic mind, from that thing which is actually is the origin of deeper thinking. So it's both useful in the sense that it helps you actually separate those two and necessary in the sense that it's a primary practice of being able to come into clarity of self, which is the basis of all these other things. And to do, learn things like acceptance, like how to actually be available to and open to what reality is actually conveying as opposed to endeavoring to cause it to be what you want it to be. It's a practice, it is for that, it does that. That's, that's the, uh, you can only get that through that practice and that's one of the things that practice is, is doing. And then another one is this notion of integration. This notion of um, being able to become very aware of all the different aspects of mind and self and body and how they're showing up and what they're trying to say. And being able to become 
compassionate, I suppose, or loving, so as to allow them to express themselves, right? not to repress yourself, not to be a tyrant to yourself, not to have some aspect of yourself calling out and trying to call something up and to show itself and speak itself and repress it and, and shove it down. Because then if you do that, you're disintegrated, you're out of an integrity. And this will create, well, it will create havoc actually. It will for sure come to bite you in the ass at some point. Um, and make you extremely vulnerable to a wide variety of blind spots in sovereignty space. So, and of course the key to that is self-acceptance. So remember I talked about the notion of acceptance, well the recursion on that is actually able to enter into acceptance with self, so that you can actually allow the parts of you that you may judge, you may want to have your sort of computer mind has been somehow trying to say isn't a good thing or should not be happening, and actually to allow those things to show up and to I'm going to say honor them more than accept them because what you're doing is you're actually allowing them to be revealed as the purity of the essence of what they are, which they are, right? Um, but they may not be able to be clearly that until you've actually honored them. There's, there's a lot of depth here. I mean, this is not trivial stuff at all, and I'm not even doing it particularly well, but that's some of that, I suppose. And returning to the kind of the matrix idea, what we are, we're talking about, and I, I see that, that, Metaphor as being about individuation. Ultimately, it's all about individuation. It's like, how do you escape the traps of ideology? How do you escape the traps of um, your thought running down conceptual lines, because that's what we're used to, and becoming truly ourselves, which is what you were talking about with sovereignty. And that, that for me, is, is kind of the framework of the matrix, I guess. If, if what we're, we're talking about is escaping from that, it, it is the process of individuation. Okay. So, <clears throat> the word individuation there feels confusing to me. Um, probably because I have a meaning, I'm from Texas, mm -hmm. so I have a meaningful connection to more libertarian sensibilities. So when I hear it, I map it more in the direction of that which is, stands opposed to communitarianism. Mm. So more like individualism as opposed to individuation. Mm then I notice as you're saying that I also have an awareness of it in the context of child development, mm. right? That a child, as teenagers, adolescents are individuating, which is that they are discovering who they are by virtue of themselves, for themselves, and becoming capable of being responsible. Mm. Does that sound like what you're referring to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe it also links back into the concept of we can only truly collaborate from a space of, of genuine individual sovereignty. Mm. And that's the paradox that many people get hung up on because they want to move to this space of, no, we want to collaborate, we want to do this together, but actually you can only get there once you've done the inner work to be able to, to, to collaborate from a place of genuine sovereignty. Well, this is also a very powerful thing in the context of the, of the, the false dichotomy that I just articulated. Mm. Right? There's oftentimes a, well, a false dichotomy mm. that we either are individuals or we are communal. Right? It's either a consensus or it's liberty. Um, but what you're saying, and what I agree with completely, is that collaboration takes place in a space that, is, that transcends that dichotomy. That it is precisely to the degree to which we are most fully individuated, that we are most fully capable of expressing that which is most meaningful and also most capable of simultaneously clear, hearing clearly, listening clearly, and expressing clearly, because we have become clear, right? We have become nothing but that which we are. Um, and the process of doing that requires a serious amount of skill. Some of the characteristics that seem to be showing up in these individuals are, for example, courage. Yes. Uh, they have the archetypal virtue of courage, which is sort of notably absent from our. Yeah, there was someone asked me like why I even made some music with Peterson in it in the first place, or what I liked about him, and the first thing that came to mind was courage, was yeah. bravery, yeah, was the, someone standing up for something, right? Whatever that is, in in the face of. of and, and you can imagine that, that, like a deep level, like in our in our bones, or even in our like reproductive organs, mm -hmm. the part of us that has been all about how the hell do tribes survive has a deep sense of when there are, when there is no courage, 
we're probably fucked. So when, when we feel an absence of courage, yes. and then courage shows up, we're like, okay, that. Whatever that is, yes. it needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, so that's one, one piece. And then the other piece that we also see is, well, I guess I'm going to break this into two. One is this notion of a, uh, an unreasonable attraction to the truth. Right, so a sense of a willingness to say, to, to take pain, to like suffer in, in defense of what is perceived to be true. Right, so rather than being able to capitulate or to equivocate, saying, no, I'm just going to kind of like come in and say what I think is true. And take the almost, almost blindly, not, not like calculating I'm going to take the consequences because I think it's a good idea. Mm. But for some reason, I'm just wired as one of these people who just can't feel good about things not being true. And then the other aspect over here is something about stepping out, like a, a bigger picture, like zooming out and taking a look at things that are not right in front of us and trying to say, like, wait a minute, something's going on. And again, like if you think about this in terms of just straight evolution, you can imagine that there's a situation where we've been encamped in a valley for a long time. And it's worked out. We've got a good way of being. And, but we're noticing, for example, that maybe the hunt isn't producing as well as it used to, or the watering hole seems to be getting drier every couple of years. And most people still are just kind of like, that's not their, that's not their thing. Right? They're just focused on what's going on. But a couple of folks, they step back. And they're like, wait a minute, what's that mean? Like, what's happening here? And suddenly they're like, whoa, hold on, guys. We may have to leave. Now, leaving the valley is dangerous as shit, right? Going from where you are, where things work, and you understand what's happening to a new place is a really bad idea. So it's not going to be well received which is why it takes a certain kind of courage to be willing to step up and say it. But because we've had to do that a lot to be humans, and, and humans more than any other animal, right? We're the only animal that has, in fact, designed the ability to get up from a whole niche, like to leave the African savanna and migrate to the, to the uh, Arctic. <clears throat> We're the only animal that has to have some system that's able to be able to detect when it's time to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so then this is the ability to step back and try to figure out, like, okay, what is the basis that we can actually use to perceive a bigger picture that allow us to make good choices in, a, in an environment where something is wrong? And it's going to be very subtle. Like, you can't w name it very well if it's at the mythopoetic layer. So maybe that's what I think, is that that's what's happening. It's showing up.